On the stage, we're going to have scholar and author of Righteous Republic, Ananya Vajpayee, well-known author and commentator Manu Joseph, whose latest book is Miss Leila, Armed and Dangerous, writer Prayag Akbar, whose first novel has been shortlisted for the Hindu Prize 2017, member of parliament and policy analyst Swapan Dasgupta, and journalist and former editor of the Hindu, Malini Parthasarathy. Since this is a rather controversial topic, we've decided to pass around little chits for the audience to put down their questions. The moderator at the end of the session will pick between five and six questions to be answered by the speaker. And the number of questions answered will depend on the time we have available at the end of the session. Please welcome our speakers onto the stage. Why is India's secular nationalism under attack? Good afternoon, everybody. First, I want to compliment Nigma Lakshman, curator of the Hindu Lit for Life, now in its eighth edition, and her team for creating such a superb ambit to hold conversations about important issues for our nation and republic. Literature derives strength from freedom of expression, which in turn requires a flourishing democracy and open society. So I'm privileged to introduce you uh, to you all, a distinguished, indeed formidable, panel of speakers who will be discussing what is the most, one of the most hotly debated and contentious topics in India. Why is India's secular nationalism, take, which has been taken for granted as a founding doctrine, why is it um, now under increasing attack? I would like to briefly frame the context of the discussion. It's a fact of history that nationalist leaders who sat together in the Council Assembly after independence to draft the constitution, whether it was Ambedkar or Nehru or Patel, three different streams of political thought. They were all categorically clear that secular state, wherein the minorities felt that they belonged equally, was the basic construct of the democratic nation that had come into being. Going forward, the constitution is very vividly written in preamble, included a commitment to liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, and a firm enunciation of a scheme of fundamental rights, especially Article 14, promising equality before the law, Article 25, Article 25, um, uh, ensuring freedom of conscience, and right freely to profess, practice, and propagate religion. All this ensured that secularism was a conscious manifestation of the commitment to equality and democracy as it missed in India's birth. The judiciary was also a strong pillar of this commitment. But the, the judgment like the S.R. Bombay case after Bhavri Machi demolition made clear that secularism was part of the basic structure of the constitution. And the dismissal of the BJP government in 1992 was upheld as it was felt the government did not, that the government allowed a mix of, uh, untenable mix of politics and religion. But what has changed since? The rise of an assertive Hindu majority movement since the 1990s has sought to overturn the premise of India as a secular nation. The questions are persistent, require deep introspection to why they have gained such traction in the public mind. Now the constitution itself has been questioned. People have asked in drawing rooms, so what if the constitution says so? The constitution is outdated, and Nehru's vision is out, um, doesn't hold good for today's India. The national imagination, as it's unfolding today, cannot be satisfied by this empty construct. And there's also a very angry rejection of Nehru and the whole set of political icons, with people like um, Savarkar, Golwalkar, and Tindal Upadhyay, and now the gaining ground. So why is secularism becoming anathema to so many? Is it because of doctrinal confusion? Did Indian secularism by maintain some ambiguity in its definition compromise itself? Is the definition of secularism as equal protection of all religions weaker than the definition of secularism as it obtains in Western democracies as a separate church and state? Or could it be as anthropologist Thomas Plum Hansen has wondered, a failure not to recognize the inherent contradiction in the phrase unity and diversity, which in effect banishes religion and culture from the public sphere, but encourages community to celebrate culture in their private spaces. To throw further light on its issue, complex issues, Ananya Bhatpai, who is illuminating book, Right Here's Republic, goes back into pre-nationalist sources of self, which then manifested as Swaraj. 
um, the party is including you the pre-independent Nazi imagination. She's also a fierce defender of secular democracy. <laughs> we have also young no novelists. We also have eminent columnists, now Gansab MP, Safan Das Gupta, who proudly labels himself as an Indian conservative and bemoans the lack of a conservative tradition, um, an intellectual tradition, and, uh, and to be and somebody who is totally moderate and on the right, not at all a defender, if I can be if I can go far to say that not somebody who's going to subscribe to VSP or RSS or any of that very, like the cow, the goat on tradition. And we have Prag Akpo, whose book is presently shortlisted for the Hindu Prize, whose fictionalized imagination of a post-secular world, ghettoizing and um, post-cosmopolitanism. It's a very interesting fictional account of this. And Manu Joseph, who was the editor of Open Magazine, ran a very strong, strongly discursive uh, media, and also won the Hindu Prize 2013 for Serious Men. He's been a columnist whose um, unique perspectives have been very different from the hackneyed response we're seeing. So I would give the floor first to Ananya, and then I would suggest Swapan would present his view, and then probably Prague, and then Manu. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Very happy to be uh, opening the discussion on this uh, this central topic to our central to our public life and to our our, our national discussion in a sense. Uh, why is uh, secular nationalism under attack? Um, I think the very simple answer is that it's under attack because uh, uh, we are living uh, under a regime um, that seeks to replace um, uh, secular nationalism with religious nationalism. Um, and that really is uh, uh, a very basic sort of a struggle uh, over what kind of uh, nation uh, India uh, sees itself as, as having been in the past and as becoming in the future. Um, as I see it, uh, the opposite of secularism um, is not religiosity, it's majoritarianism. And the struggle here, which is really a life and death struggle, uh, is uh, whether India can survive as a secular nation state or whether it is really going to become um, a majoritarian Hindu state. Um, one, uh, one way of putting it that, that I've been thinking about for, for several years now is as a struggle between a Gandhian uh, conception of Hind Swaraj uh, and a Savarkarite conception of uh, the Hindu Rashtra. Um, that, that is what is at stake here. Um, of course, 70 years have passed since, since the founding uh, of, the, of the Indian uh, state and, and uh, the, the constitution of course came into force in 1950 um, and over time, um, things change and values change and national politics moves on. Um, but uh, in, in the current uh, leadership, we have uh, f flag bearers of Hindu nationalism uh, who, who defend some version of a Savarkarite vision of the Hindu Rashtra, um, but there's nobody really to carry uh, the Gandhian, Nehruvian, Tagorean project uh, of Hind Swaraj forward. That space is currently empty, and that is why we are facing a crisis in, in, in secular nationalism. Um, critics of secularism often say that uh, it's a foreign concept, it's an un-Indian concept. Um, it really is tied up with the history of Chris Christianity, Protest Protestantism, with Enlightenment, and with, with Europe's history, and it's only an import into India. Um, but as you know, many of my own uh, colleagues and teachers, uh, scholars like Raji Bhargav and Ashish Nandi have shown, I think, very successfully, um, India has always had some version uh, of, of, of what we today understand by secularism, which is the ability uh, to live amidst difference, uh, for the coexistence of different identities um, with some notion of uh, basic mutuality, civility, tolerance, um, conflict, yes, uh, but not 
uh, necessarily a conflict that results in um, a majority dominating uh, many small minorities. In a sense, we have always been a society, uh, a coalition of minorities. Um, and uh, Malini was talking about the inherent contradiction between unity and diversity. Uh, but the slogan unity in diversity was actually uh, a coinage of Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, and, and for him, it described the very quintessence of, of, of what Indian society is, regardless of uh, the, the, the national form or the state form. Um, but of course, it's that much more important to maintain uh, in, in, in a democratic setting. Um, the other thing which critics of uh, secularism uh, tend to attack is that the word secularism actually only entered the constitution in the 1970s. Uh, and that it was not there from the very beginning in, 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 the, in the founding document. Um, but I think this is, uh, uh, this is a kind of quibble, uh, because whether the word was there or not, uh, all of the ideas and values that that word represents for us, uh, everything that it has to teach us about equality, about respect, uh, about difference, about diversity, um, uh, and about equal rights, uh, is already present in the Constitution. And putting the word secular in there only makes those norms, values, and ideals explicit, um, after which it becomes very difficult to try to remove it as, as is currently uh, being sought. Um, a third kind of attack on the idea of secularism is to say, well, what do we really mean by it? Do we mean dharma nirpekshita, or do we mean sarva dharma sambhav? Right? That is to say, do we mean an equidistance from all uh, religions or do we mean uh, an equal love for all religions on the part of the state? Um, and the key, of course, is the term dharm, uh, which for Hindu nationalists and the Sangh Parivar can really only ever mean Hindu dharm uh, and not uh, simply a, a kind of neutral word for religion which can apply to a number of different kinds of, of religions. Um, and so I think um, in, in recent times, um, with the kinds of extreme violence that is being visited on members of minority communities, um, with, um, uh, with lynchings, with the politics around cow and beef, uh, with ideas like love jihad and ghar wapsi, um, with outright uh, cases of intimidation and, and murder, um, I think we are really moving from um, uh, a sort of um, default of at least uh, you know, uh, aspiring to some idea of national integration towards a kind of partisan view of what India is that really need, leads to national disintegration. Um, and I don't think that for a country which Ramchandra Guha has called the most diverse nation in the world, this is, this is a sustainable way to go. Um, and a really uh, good index of the crisis of secularism, which is a crisis for all of us equally, uh, uh, not just for minorities, but equally for the majority community as well, um, is the kind of uh, second class citizenship towards which um, uh, minorities are increasingly being pushed uh, in this country, uh, which undermines um, uh, the very foundations of uh, equal citizenship on which we like to believe that the world's largest democracy is built and ought to stay standing. Um, I think the fear, the insecurity, the lagging social indices of development, um, the, the terrible statistics uh, of, of social and economic uh, and political rights uh, surrounding minority communities in this country um, are, are really an indictment uh, of this attempt to hijack um, uh, India from its uh, secular platform uh, and, and reinterpret it uh, as a majoritarian Hindu Rashtra. So um, I, you know, I, 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 I put it to you that um, the fact that secularism is under attack, um, you know, should not just be um, uh, cheapened 
uh, or um, sort of um, made fun of as an attack by uh, you know the new ruling elites on uh, you know a fading liberal order. Uh, really, the crisis is much deeper than that, and it it affects the lives of millions of our fellow citizens, um, those uh, who are. Um, uh, not even necessarily liberal or secular themselves, right? But who need um, a, 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 a basic structure of equality, of, of respect, uh, and of um, a, a distance between uh, religion and state uh, for them to uh, continue with, with their struggle to survive and to flourish as Indians first and Hindus or Muslims or Christians or Jews or Sikhs or tribals later. Um, so I'll just stop there and um, hope that we can continue the discussion uh, with others on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya, for a very succinct illustration of what you think are the actual implications of the attacks on secularism and how it's intrinsically linked to the attack on democracy. I think uh, Swafan has been trying to make the case for a long time that it's wrong to say that it's pro secularism or anti secularism. And what is really in contention is the definition of secularism. And he would say he's as secular as the rest. So I would leave it to him to tell us how to do how that happened. Uh, thank you, Malini, for that uh, very generous introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to this festival. I'm accustomed to speaking in Hindu festivals, but I must say this is a novelty for me to speak at the Hindu festival. <laughs> it took me to, a bit by surprise. I think Ananya was quite right when she said that secularism did not come into India merely because in 1976, during the height of the emergency, Indira Gandhi changed the preamble of the constitution and introduced two words, one of which was secularism and one was socialism. We leave the socialism part aside for the moment. Let's talk about the secularism. Did the introduction of that term make a qualitative difference? I think it did, in one respect. Not that Article 14 and not that Article 25 of the Constitution, which Malini referred to, were negated, or that the spirit of those articles, the principle of non-discrimination at an institutional level was ever negated. But what secularism, by introducing it in the preamble, they tried to do was that they tried to codify it. And I think that, if you recall, most of the problems which we have had in India, centered on secularism, have resulted from the, the after 1976, when an attempt was made to codify it, when an attempt was made to suggest that really religion revolves only in the private puja room. Leave it there. Have no bearing. There is no sense in which the culture of India is any way influenced by what might be called a religious underpinning of society. That culture is somehow separated from the idea of religion. That godlessness must necessarily define culture. That was the basis on which that thing was defined. And very well, and post after that, it's really all those things which have come in. Let me get to a basic point. Article 14, Article 25, these are very important facets because they basically defined or reinforced the idea that discrimination has no place in the modern Indian Republic. That you cannot be discriminated merely because you are a Hindu, that it cannot be discriminated because you are a Muslim, or you cannot be discriminated because you're an atheist. That was enshrined very much in the Constitution. But the nature of our nationhood was defined by something else. It didn't come about because the Constitution gave us the nationhood. Some people talk about India was born in 1950. No, sir. 
India was not born in 1950. India has a greater prehistory. And that prehistory is bound up in our culture. And that culture has to be acknowledged. That culture need not be acknowledged in the constitution, but it must be acknowledged in society. And that society is very important because how, what we are as a nation is not defined merely by our rights as enshrined by the constitution, but what we are culturally. Now, Article 14 and Article 25 are very good, but there was one omission Malini made. Article 44 of the Indian Constitution. What does Article 44 mean? That the state shall, note the word shall, endeavor to introduce a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. It's an important thing. Because it says we as a republic must be governed by a uniform set of laws which are non-discriminatory, which applies to every citizen, whether of whatever faith or whatever denomination or whatever thing you are. That's a test of modernity. That's a test of modern republicanism. Why is it that that particular thing has not been now been applied? Why is it that the last time the Muslim social code was actually ever debated or even tinkered with in India, enacted, was in 1937 and 1939. So independent India for 70 years has not touched it. What is the reason for it? And I think the reason for it was very well elaborated in a book, the biography, the three-volume monumental biography of Jawaharlal Nehru, which I believe should be read by everybody, by, by a very eminent son of Chennai, Sarvapali Gopal. And he wrote, what was the basis on the Nehruvian mindset? And I just quote from him. And he wrote, the problem of minorities was basically one for the majority community to handle. The test of success was not what the Hindus thought, but how the Muslims and other communities felt. And more explicit elaboration of what constituted the secular mindset cannot be there. And therefore, what has happened in the past decade or so, I would not really say with Ananya that the change of regime in Delhi in 2014 was the signal for it, is that there has been a deep sense of anxiety over this lack of even-handedness that laws are not applicable to everybody uniformly. In December 2006, Dr. Manmohan Singh made a very interesting speech to the fellow chief ministers at the National Development Council. And he said, minorities, particularly the Muslim minority, must have the first claim on resources. Now, is this secularism? Every citizen, you, you can say every citizen of India must have the claim on resources. You can say the poor of India must have this claim on resources. You can say the deserving have the claim on resources. You can even say the state has a claim on resources if you're that way inclined. But to single out one particular community and then if you attack that, say you are assaulting secularism. What is the secularism you are assaulting? You're not attacking the principle of non-discrimination. You are attacking the application of secularism as it exists in India today. And the intellectual stranglehold which exists among the particular section which says if you talk about the Muslim, if you talk about a uniform civil code, you're being anti-secular. If you talk about the integration of India, you're being anti-secular. You're trying to unify. Nobody's saying we should have uniform of worship. 
today you're celebrating Pongal, I am celebrating Makar Sankranti in Bengal, some people are Shiva worshippers, I am a Kali worshipper, some people are Muslims in their personal faith, some people are Christians in their various denominations of Christianity, all these are part and parcel of our life, no one is ever going to take that away. The question is how does it intrude into the state policy? When it starts, what you are starts intruding into the state policy, a backlash invariably follows it. And I have no doubt, and I have little problem in admitting that there have been cases of excesses. There have been the people who are bending the stick the other direction. But it is not to create a Hindu Rashtra. It is not to actually say that only Hindus must occupy positions of prime minister, president, etc., etc. But it is to say, have some balance. We've gone overboard. Restore the balance. The uni acknowledge that India is a country which has a very deep cultural underpinning. This underpinning was recognized by various people and ensure that discrimination and denomination do not apply to state policy. That should be the thing of secularism and that is why the and lack of that is why today this, this form of secularism is under serious attack. Thank you very much. Judging by the applause, I would think Twapan's narrative is another illustration of my point, the counter narrative is gaining ground. But my only small uh, Sort of that question, I would just want to, a small point I want to add to your question about uh, African secularism. Part and parcel of the whole doctrine of original conscious secularism was a conscious protection of minorities. Assuming the majority always has a cultural dominance, therefore minorities require special protection. So um, I suppose um, on that note, I would ask Kayak, who is very extremely futuristic account explains in practice what could ghettoization and a post-cosmopolitan universe mean. So when this topic was presented to us, why is India's secular nationalism under attack? I mean, it's, it's fascinating for a number of reasons, but uh, I think what really struck me about it is, and that there's, there's a big distinction, of course, between secularism and secular nationalism, which I think we're getting away from in this debate. Uh, we can argue whether India is becoming secular, more, more secular or less secular uh, until the cows come home, if you'll pardon the pun. But uh, I, think, I think this topic in its phrasing, uh, I think this topic in its phrasing, why is India secular nationalism under attack? I think it allows us to look at how secular nationalism actually developed in India and how, if we go back to the roots of it, and Mr. Dasgupta is quite right when he says that, you know, the history of India goes back further than 1976 or 1950. We, we go back a long, long way, and uh, our ideas of nationalism and secularism stem from ideas that were started a long time ago, thinking that started a long time ago. So, secularism in the Indian context generally means, you know, that there's an equality of all religions before the state. Whereas secular nationalism is kind of, uh, it's creating an idea of a nation and it's trying to uh, envision a nation in which people are connected loosely by like a shared past, uh, a sense of a shared past and a shared citizen, citizenship and a con sort of shared present. And this is supposed to sort of supersede all differences of ethnic ethnicity, all religious differences, cultural differences. So now if you, I mean, India, for its independent history, has decidedly been a secular state. We have, we have a sense of equality before of all religions, and we, our state has tried to, tried to maintain that kind of boundary between itself and how people practice their religion. But so much of our sense of nation, nationhood, and nationalism derives from ideas that were birthed in, you know, that, that came in the late 18th century, sorry, late 19th century and the early 20th century. When you look at the first wave, I mean, where does nationalism in India come from? Our sense of nation comes from, it actually all started off in Bengal. Uh, you know, the, the first articulations of Indian nationalism came from, uh, you know, the great wave of Bengali intellectuals, Aurobindo Ghosh, uh, Bankin Chandar Chattopadhyay, the Tagore brothers. And in these imaginings, in these, this first conception of India as a nation, 
the nation was seen as a goddess, a beneficent, very uh, a mother goddess, but who was decidedly a Hindu deity. Now, uh, there's a very famous uh, painting by Abhanandri, Abhanandri, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's brother, I, I can't say, uh, that, you know, that shows this deity in uh, saffron robes, carrying in her hands you know, ver uh, various boons for the Indian patriot. And then there's Bankim Chandra uh, Chattabadhyay's uh, song, Vande Matram, which has of, you know, a number of implications for Muslims, for the, the Indian Muslim. But it, it also began as a hymn to the Bengali mother, to the Banga Mata. And uh, now this idea of the nation is very potent for many reasons, but I think it, if, if you imagine the ma nation as a mother, it's because the mother is a source of nourishment, the mother no nurtures you, but the mother also demands your protection. So for a male, so this idea really proliferated across the nation in, uh, you know, joining the colonial Indian uh, times. It really spread all over the world, all over India. So you had, in, in the Northern Belt, you have this very big uh, group of, I mean, you have Bharat Mata Ki Jai, which is in, uh, in Delhi where I grew up, you come across this symbol all the, uh, you come across this slogan all the time. You see it on the backs of cars and buses, you hear it at cricket matches, and the act of chanting Bharat Mata Ki Jai, which is again related to the mother deity, it's, it's seen as a patriotic test almost. You know, you're, it's a way of confirming who belongs to the nation, but it's also a way of enlisting who does not belong to the nation. And for the Indian Muslim, as, as, a, as a wanting to be part of this nation, to envision the mother deity as, as a goddess is very difficult. It's religiously problematic. So it was as, it was problematic in the early 20th century, uh, it is problematic today. So the Indian Muslim found himself at this very key juncture of when the nation was being created and conceptualized, the Indian Muslim found himself excluded from this very, uh, from this expression of nationalism and from the way nationalism was being fostered throughout the country. And the way, and today, the way nationalism is celebrated today. So when, so you had this kind of religious envisioning of India, and then you had in following from Nehru, following from our secular, our great secularists, you had a competing vision of India, which was the secular nationalist vision. But you know, the symbolism over there was never as potent as the mother. And we have a, we have a sort of vague sense of the constitution in India. I think there's a vague sense of the constitution as the bedrock of the Indian state. This is, you know, this would be the secular nationalist vision of India, that the constitution and its principles are uh, enshrined, and the principles and enshrines are what give us our sense of a nation. And I know a lot of people in minority, you know, a lot of minorities tend to put, place a lot of faith in the constitution because of this other vision of India, which is sort of veering towards a Hindu nation. But no, at no time has uh, the constitution been able, you know, has, has Indian nationalism been premised on that sense of India as a, as a nation with constitutional values. If you look at, if you compare this to the experience in the United States, where, you know, they actually have, one of the major political fault lines in America is about the Second Amendment, about the right to bear arms. And it becomes, it's such a fraught debate because for them that the principles of the constitution are very, very important. And I've been trying to think of, you know, I've, tried, I've been trying to think of a, a symbol, uh, an image that, that was used to create, a secular, to create a secular India. And I keep going back to this ad that used to play when I was a child on Doodarshan, which had Mile Sur Tera Hamara, you know, it used to come all the time. And the, uh, the ad showed famous Indians of different religions, different castes different regions coming together, you know, the, these are all like people of accomplishment and they came together and stood as one, as Indians. And when I watched it as a child, it certainly, it made me proud, you know, it gave me a sense of Indian nationhood, it gave me a sense of belonging. But even that concept of India is always imagined India as a whole of different parts. You know, instead of one nation, various sub-nations come and have gathering together and building this kind of elusive nation that we were going to create. And then ad never explained, or our conception of secularism never explained what gave this nation its identity and what kept it, you know, that what kept it whole. And I think, uh, I think this is why the BJP is able, you know, so quickly it's able to portray itself as a party of nationalists and the real true strong nationalists and it's able to put, portray its opponents as anti-nationals. 
it's you know the congress is a it's a it's a, it's an institution of the state almost it's such a it's such a has such a long history and it's ludicrous to argue that a party like the congress you know does not have the best interests of india at heart but the bjp is able to argue this successfully time and again they keep they keep making this claim now if when you have jignesh mivani and umar khalid both of them have made appeals to india that are based on the constitution you know they're based on principles of the constitution yet those those appeals fall flat very quickly and they in turn they are the ones who are portrayed as anti nationals because and i think this really derives from where our sense of nationhood and nation comes from and that's because we, for so for so many of us to to you know the tukre tukre gang as a gang, gang that is seeking to mutilate india and to mutilate the mother okay. thank you very uh, eloquent I think, I think Manu Joseph, one of the editors, has been very liberal at the same time, unafraid to take positions that do not conform to a particular pattern. So we'd love to hear your views. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Uh, there are some expressions only the Hindu newspaper uses, like industrial relations, and I think secular nationalism. You know? So the question is, why is secular nationalism under attack it's a very tambram question <laughs> i'll tell you why i i grew up here in kodambakkam just 5 kilometers away in a tambram colony so i know that when they want to say something they'll put it in the form of a question and i feel that this question is also stating the same thing i think if whether whether secularism or secular nationalism is under attack itself i don't think uh there is enough clarity on that matter for us to debate it uh, or to accept the question in the first place so let's let's be very very for very about the tambram we of putting things now about my boyhood in uh, chennai i was born at a time and what you should know is that i'm much younger than i look so i was uh, i was born at a time i was exactly sandwiched between two forms of nationalism so by the time i was a boy Uh, uh in the early 80s trust me i there was no nationalism that's what i remember about my boyhood in fact all our jokes i don't know if you remember it in fact the circumstances today is such that you would have forgotten that all our jokes in all our jokes where the indian the american and the and the englishman is walking into the bar the indian was the idiot an indian and american or an englishman on a boat the indian was the idiot unless there was a pakistani <laughs> and today nobody even knows that those jokes existed in fact once at iit's convocation a chief guest said brain drain is better than brain in the drain <laughs> i tell you that news traveled across chennai and everybody laughed because it was genuinely funny and there was some truth in it and nobody was offended nobody nobody confused patriotism with a good joke in fact i learned about nationalism from sri lankan migrants and suddenly in our group there were these uh, uh, tamil boys who were very passionate about this ambiguous concept of the state uh in fact they were the ones who told us that i mean we love our country and you can feel very strongly about your country in fact i would remember that uh, in fact i i think i also became patriotic only when i was dealing with them because they found tamilians very dirty and they found they would keep bitching about uh, chennai and for the first time i was getting angry about a concept like a city uh in fact when one of those uh, uh sri lankan tamils would set the field during a cricket match i would i would wonder how the, the hindu is calling him a refugee and how can a refugee tell me where to stand in my own city you know so those were the beginnings and now of course things have changed the the fact is that at that point india had failed uh indian socialism had failed and we had no real pride in ourselves we had to invent uh we had to invent pride but there is such a thing called secular nationalism and what exactly it is i've become a salesman of a of a concept which is that when the elite of a system becomes an underdog in another system uh, they get very angry so they have to compensate uh in a very moralistic way 
And what was Indian nationalism largely was that the Indian elite found uh, the Brahmin of the Brahmins, which is the white man. To fight the by white man, they had to stitch together a coalition through the moralistic force of nationalism. It was very important for our freedom movement. And it is very interesting that the Dalits have not bought this. You know, they're still resisting the idea of, of a very convenient kind of nationalism which the upper class needed to fight their own Brahmins. Now, while it was, of course, it was convenient and, and, and I think it, in, in the long run it was a blessing. Um, but then, of course, then we had to define the idea of secularism and we have a, we have, we, there are some English words that work only in India. Like, for example, pre and uh, uh, intimate as a form of informing. In fact, when I would write for New York Times, I once actually used intimate and they said, no, no, that, that kind of meaning, it doesn't exist, you know, I didn't even know. <laughs> Apparently, intimate is something else. Uh, <laughs> uh, similarly, secularism in India, secularism is supposed to mean the absence of God from state. But in India, you get all your gods, <laughs> every god and every sadhu also. I went through a period when I was an editor of Open, I went through a period of one week where something weird happened, where I could see India's secularism in full force. I was at the Bombay airport and there were riots in the Bombay airport. What had happened was a sadhu had boarded a plane, I wanted to board a plane in Lucknow, and he refused to let them uh, pass his scepter uh, in the X-ray machine because he said it's too sacred. And I can't be separated from my scepter because then I wouldn't be a godman. So that news reached Bombay and his followers were rioting. And I couldn't leave the airport because some guy's stick was not allowed. I knew exactly where that stick should go, but I didn't. A few days, a few days later, I commissioned the mo one of the most frivolous simple stories I'd ever commissioned, which is a toy, like someone, in fact, my film correspondent pitched an idea, let's do a story on the toilet habits of Bollywood stars. That's a fantastic idea, let's do it. And she did it, and suddenly there is an arrest warrant for her. And we didn't know what we went wrong, we just, we're just talking about toilet habits of Hiratik Roshan and Manisha Koyal. But apparently, we figured that there was a line in her story which said that Manisha Koyal's dog Dog's name is Mustafa. <laughs> so there was an arrest warrant for her because apparently it's one of the names of the prophets. And that's not, just not allowed. And then there was no surprise, there was nothing. We just had to manage the situation. I mean, these are moments when you're like, people say India is secular, secular, secular. I know exactly what it means. It means you can do anything in the name of God. <laughs> and also, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to spare my Christians, there was a, suddenly there was a, I mean, I have too many stories. <laughs> so once, I, mean, uh, I, I think it was um, uh, a debate on BBC where they were making fun of the Pope. It was very entertaining and suddenly it went off. The screen went blank, no channels. I was 100% sure that the cable operator was a Christian. <laughs> I called up, not to get the channel back, just to check. And he was. And he said that this is offending my sensibility, so he switched off the cable. You can do anything, as long as you're a believer. You know, as an editor, what I often encounter, and something which I don't understand, there's something called contrast, contrast journalism, where you take one element of India, like a girl in a mini skirt, and put a woman in a burqa together, and it's a photograph. And it is supposed to say something about India. Like the ISRO scientist in a sari. <laughs> Apparently it's a contrast. One, I think the most intelligent question you can ask about this contrast journalism is so. Because this part of this contrast journalism is photographs of temple, church, and mosque together. <laughs> and it is supposed, we are supposed to, we are supposed to feel good about it. 
It's a most meaningless image. It's just that maybe all three have violated some rules and maybe none of them should exist. But the question is, is something under attack? Is something that we all want, something that we believe in, is it under attack? Yes, maybe uh, we can't consume cows now, in case you like cows. Uh, <clears throat> and there are things that Muslims can't do anymore, which they could earlier. Uh, and maybe, uh, seriously, maybe it's easier now for Hindu goons to attack as opposed to the goons from the other religions who have to take a kind of back seat because uh, they, they are not allowed to do a few things. And maybe, maybe, yes, these are reasonably important things and there are these ideas which are under attack. But, you know, I'm never really that scared about nationalism because I know that if, ultimately, if someone says, you have to say every day, Bharat Mata Ki Jai, I'll first say, you first pronounce Kani Muri. This might sound facetious, but I'm telling you, as long as most of RSS cannot pronounce Varaparam or Kanimuri, <laughs> they can't, they, because Hindu nationalism, uh, any form of nationalism needs language and you have to get past us. <clears throat> Though sometimes the popularity of Paniritika in Chennai does worry me, you know, is something changing. But I think as long as India has diverse languages and languages are, uh, they have stronger roots now than before, Hindu, Hindi nationalism will always remain North Indian nationalism. And there is no such thing as North Indian nationalism because that's the whole point of nationalism. It has to be national or nothing. But there are some aspects of some, some very serious elements which the liberal journalists, I, I do feel that liberal journalists exaggerate a lot because it's a humanitarian issue and they get a lot of mileage and they have created an atmosphere where we feel that there's a sense of danger. But there are some aspects where I feel that the exaggeration or the alarm is justified. For example, the lynching of Muslims or lynching of Dalits. You can't say how many lynchings per million population would qualify for, you know, for, for us to agree it's a problem. No, even if there's one lynching, the job of the media is to say, my God, it's horrible, it's horrible. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but the reason why I'm also hopeful is that, is, is the nationalism of pride. I never thought I'll ever say it. I'm among the journalists, or I was among the journalists, who would lampoon the nationalism of pride, that aviation technology we had when, uh, during uh, uh, Ram's time, and uh, we had a transfer of technology from aliens, who are not Bangladeshis, but real aliens, you know. <coughs> uh, but you know, and also, uh, I did uh, scoff at India's attempt to make the first tablet. You know that India, I think it was called Akash, I don't know if you remember, the Indian government made the first Indian iPad. In tribute, a few hours later, Steve Jobs died. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Akash failed. But, but, I, I feel that, now I have a different view, I feel that nationalism of pride is important, is extremely important for us uh, to believe that we can do things. Okay, others might have done these things better, but the fact that we can do these things, I think that's important because, only because, the nationalism of pride is followed by the nationalism of shame. And that is the nationalism that is important. The nationalism of shame, now it's already happening. Now this pollution, now everybody in Delhi is woken up to Oh, there's so much pollution. That's because the idea of home has taken root. They know that they are not flying away to the United States because it's very difficult because there's another character sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> another nationalist, you know, the clash of nationalists. So when the bigger nationalists have ensured 
that the Indian middle class is finally beginning to see this as a permanent home and they are beginning to feel ashamed of a few things and that will save us. Thank you. Thank you. Because we are, we are running out of time. We are running out of time, so I just picked two questions. One for, for Swapan and one for Ananya, which would probably represent uh, the two op opposing sides. The question is Swapan first. How do you react to the imposed beef ban, censorship issues like Padmavati film, and the present wave of forceful propagation of very culturally convenient Hindu ideology? Well, in India, a lot of things happen which are downright silly. And I think the attempt over the kafafle over Padmabhati constitutes as a major act of silliness. What, what is a film which is depicting a poem as far as I can make out? Why that should offend people? But it has. But I think there's a larger question here. And I think the beef issue is, is, is important. It's a problematic and a touchy one. And I think sometimes it's easy to trivialize it, but let's look at certain things. Number one, whether we like it or not, cow slaughter is one of those things whose ban or prevention is recommended in the Indian constitution along with the directive, in the directive principles. It is an extremely touchy issue. Number two, let us look at it this way, that yes, it does offend the absolute food freedom if we look, look at it that way. And three, it is also a fact that eating beef is not obligatory to any faith as far as I know. <laughs> it is certainly not obligatory and it's a one of mutual accommodation and I think it should be done. One of the problems in India which we've had and I think the problem of secularism and I think this also epitomizes is that we've got the problem of what might be called differentiated citizenship. That means that no citizen is in a sense really equal. We've got separate laws. And that is the real problem with our secularism. That we can have separate personal laws and if I tell you that, you know, ban triple talaq, then you'll say I'm anti-secular. If someone says, I'll be allowed to eat beef, then someone will be saying you're anti-Hindu. And I think it's that whole culture of differentiation which really needs to be assaulted if we are to make, if we are to actually uphold the essence of what might be called an equal and just society. And the principle of mutual accommodation, which is necessary for that, is, is, is important. And whether it's a beef ban or a restraint from actually willfully offending someone else should be the principle. Um, I also need to say that you can speak to everybody outside the auditorium. People like Ananya, Swapan and others be available to speak to you further. So meanwhile, one sort of emblematic question to Ananya. Do you think that the weakness of the political opposition against the attack on secularism is a real cause for worry? Yes, I, I, I sorry, it, it seemed uh, from the number of questions we had, uh, it seemed like every single member of the audience had sent us a chit. Uh, and so we had to randomly pick uh, uh, pick a couple, but uh, I do think that uh, that the fact the fact that the attack on secularism is 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 uh, really coming from from the ruling dispensation, and that there is no opposition to defend secularism strongly uh, is the cause for worry. Um, I don't think at the level of ideas that the idea of secularism, whether it's defined in this way or that way, uh, is a weak one, but it needs uh, strong 
uh, claimants, strong um, uh, uh, articulations, uh, and it needs a, a, a deep uh, reservoir of faith in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a secular India that we are not seeing emanating, at least from the existing uh, uh, parties that are in opposition, even the ones that have historically championed this idea. Um, I just want to quickly say that um, some of the ways in which um, uh, Shopanda, uh, who certainly knows his Nehru, um, uh, twisted uh, the meaning of secularism to say that secularism is somehow an attack on Indian culture. I think quite the opposite is the case. Um, Indian, Indian culture, if there is such a thing in this mosaic of, of, of many, many cultures, uh, and in Tamil Nadu, you, you know this better than, 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 than anywhere, I think, uh, is, is uh, quintessentially um, uh, secular because we understand how to live with difference. Uh, we have always done this and he's quite correct to say that, uh, you know, it did not begin all of a sudden on the morning of 27th January 19, uh, 1950 or even in 1977. Um, but to say that uh, secularism militates against our lived culture is the exact opposite of the truth. Um, and to, to also to equate secularism with godlessness uh, really seems to me to be a kind of um, malign misinterpretation uh, of the essence of uh, Indian secularism. Because in India, secularism means not that we are, you and I are godless, but that I have a right to worship my God in my way, in my mosque, just as you have a right to worship your God in your way, in your temple. And that this is not a nation of temples, it's not a nation by, for, or of any one community. Um, and it can accommodate uh, the kind of diversity that it fa in fact it does accommodate, um, uh, regardless of, of uh, elections uh, which come and go and governments which come and go. Um, so I think uh, the case needs to be made. Uh, and if the existing opposition is not making it, then it it's perhaps time for citizens to stand up and make it for themselves um, um, to make India a better, safer, and more equal country for all of us. I think with this, we'll have to wrap it up. Malini, but it also means we have a right to worship as we want to, in our own way. But we should also be governed by one set of laws which operates across religions as for citizens of India. So I think now the time's up, so we'll wrap it up now. But I think what, what is really clear is that a lot of homework needs to be done on definition of secularism. While we meet, I mean, as a, as a democracy, we have to defend it in practice. We clearly need to do more homework on how we define secularism. Thank you.